Welcome everyone. We're just letting the room fill up um, until before we get started. Just see a few more people coming in. Okay, I think we can begin. Welcome everyone, my name is Christine Schmidt and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library in London. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event and we are truly honored to launch Professor Lawrence Langer's newest book, The After Death of the Holocaust Tonight. We welcome everyone to the event and although of course it would be much nicer to be able to do this in person, this online format means we are gathering from around the world to celebrate this important achievement. The book presents a collection of Professor Langer's essays, which examine the ways in which language has been used to evoke what he calls the deathscape and the hopescape of the Holocaust. I'm sure that we will be exploring this terminology in further depth this evening, ably guided by our chair, Ben Barco, as well as other specific themes addressed in Professor Langer's essays, including the impact of site visits, survivor testimonies, literature and art on our responses to the Holocaust. One of the enduring aspects of Professor Langer's work that is very apparent in these essays is his ongoing grappling with the significance of the impact of erroneous, sentimental, or redemptive treatments of the Holocaust, particularly, but not only in public discourse. As Professor Langer writes in one of his studies, we cannot change the face of atrocity through verbal manicure. He reminds us through these essays and indeed his extensive body of influential work that we should not and cannot flinch from the horrors at the center of the Holocaust, no matter how challenging this may be. Before I formally introduce our speakers and invite them to the virtual stage, just a few notes of housekeeping. You'll be kept on mute throughout the entire program, but please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat. And after the formal discussion, we'll have about 15 minutes or so at the end of the program to take up as many questions as we can from the audience. And I'll be feeding these um, back, to, back to Ben. The chat function can be found at the bottom of your screen if you haven't used Zoom before. I assume most people have, but just in case. Um, I've also enabled closed captioning, so if you require this, you can click it at the bottom of the screen. Um, just note that it is auto caption, um, so there may be, it is subject to some errors. We are recording this event as well, um, but your camera will not appear on the screen. Finally, if you have any technical difficulties, please feel free to send uh, me or my colleague Martina a direct message and we can try to do our best to help. Now to introduce our speakers. Professor Lawrence Langer is Emeritus Professor of English at Simmons University in Boston in the United States and a renowned scholar of Holocaust literature. He has made an extraordinary contribution to the field of Holocaust studies through his life's work, including publications such as Versions of Survival, The Holocaust and the Human Spirit, Holocaust Testimonies, The Ruins of Memory, Art from the Ashes, A Holocaust Anthology, and Preempting the Holocaust, to name a few. He's also published a number of interpretations and studies of the work of survivor artist Samuel Bach. On a personal note, it's through his important writing on survivor testimonies that I came to know Professor Langer's work as a student. I worked alongside one of the survivors, the late Abe Pasternak, whose testimony was featured in many of Langer's books. Abe and I researched transcripts of testimonies recorded by the late Sid Bolkowski at the University of Michigan Dearborn, and my friendship with Abe and the framing of this testimony by Professor Langer shaped my early engagement with the subject. I came to meet Professor Langer as a graduate student when we curated a small exhibition of Sam's Bo Sam Bach's work at Clark University, and we were just uh, reminiscing about this, and this was also a very formative experience for me. So I'm very pleased to be able to thank him personally now for his influence on my career. And on this theme, I would also like to introduce our chair, Ben Barco. Ben is the chair of the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association of Leeds and chair of the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation's academic advisory board for the new memorial planned near parliament. But he's likely more well known as the director of the Wiener Holocaust Library from 1998 to 2019, where he made a profound impact, not only on the direction, work and reputation of the library, but also in our field more broadly. Although he was formerly my boss, I'm delighted now to introduce him as a good friend. Ben, the floor is yours. Great, so wel welcome everybody and thank you, Christine, for those generous words. 
Um, it's obviously a, a, a significant privilege to to be able to speak to and and in a sense interrogate uh, Lawrence Langer, uh, which I hope won't be too intimidating. Um, I'd I think I'd like to preface the the discussion by just pointing out that one of the one of the threads that runs through through the volume is is autobiographical, and so it struck me that uh, Lawrence began his career with ho Holocaust studies in 1964, which by coincidence was the year that Dr. Alfred Wiener died. And so in a sense, we're really able to trace back to the very beginnings of, of this subject uh, through, through this dialogue. Um, I want to start my questions. Uh, I'd like to start at the, at the beginning, really by asking Lawrence about the title of the book and some of the coinages that you've introduced in it. Uh, after death, that's a very evocative and haunting word, but uh, perhaps not one that would be called a defined term. And the only instance of it that I've been able to find outside your work is a 2015 horror film about young people who wake up one day to discover that they are in hell. Uh, a feeling I'm fairly familiar with. But how do you want readers to understand this word and other terms like deathscape and hopescape? Do you feel that the grooves of writing and talking about the Holocaust are just so worn that we need a new language to move forward? Well, let me first tell you how I came up to the word um, after death. Um, I remember once I encountered uh, the following statement. One can be alive after Sobibor, which was a death camp, without having survived Sobibor. And when I heard that, I said, that doesn't make sense. If you haven't survived Sobibor, you're dead. If you're alive after Sobibor, you're alive. How can you be alive and dead? at the same time. So it began as a question I asked myself. I slowly began educating myself. I read Hannah Levy Haas's Diary of Bergen-Belsen in November um, 1944, that is about six months before the war ended, she made the entry, we have not died, but we are dead. And at the same time, in the same way, I said, that doesn't make sense. If we haven't died, we're alive. If we're dead, then we're not alive. In April of 1945, when the British were approaching the camp and she realized that she is really going to survive, she wrote the following entry. What horror, she said, this death without dying, this prolonged death. Little by little, I began to ask myself, I've been listening to these things, but I'm not sure I've been hearing them. So let's see if I can put them together into some kind of meaning. In the works of Jorge Semprin, who was, um, uh, wrote a, a, a very important Holocaust, he's a survivor of Buchenwald, Holocaust novel called The Grand Voyage, and two very important autobiographies, he wrote The Criminal Madness, of living the life of a dead man. And I said, living the life of a dead man. I mean, this is beginning to make some sense because they say it so often. Then in Charlotte Delbo's uh, autobiography, three volume autobiography um, um, called Auschwitz and After. And in a subsequent essay, she tells of visiting a friend of hers at the hospital in Paris right after the war who was just given birth to a baby. The friend survived Auschwitz together with her and the friend is weeping. And she says, why are you crying? And she says, I can't think of all those children who were murdered in Auschwitz. And then she says, and this is a classic statement, she says, I died in Auschwitz, but no one sees it. And I said to myself, a new sense of identity is developing when people say I'm alive and dead at the same time. So um, 
I was reading um, a letter written by a woman named Rachela Krinsky, who is a survivor of the Vilna ghetto. And in the ghetto, she worked together with the famous Yiddish poet, Avraham Sotskeva, um, in what was called the Paper Brigade. The Germans had them selecting the most important volume from the Jewish library in Vilna, which they would then send to Germany. And after the war, very bizarre idea, they would have a museum of the vanished Jewish culture. And she writes a letter after the war to Sutskeva, who's in Israel. She's still in Europe. And she says, when I'm on a date with a friend of mine, I don't listen to what he's saying to me. I want to scream. She says, in the mornings, I'm too lazy to wake up and begin living. But I put up appearances, and probably no one would believe me that I'm only pretending to be alive, only pretending to be alive, meaning part of me has already died. And what put this all together for me finally was a statement from um, an interview, which I watched, of a survivor who is telling us about a problem she has. She says, when I had a baby, I wanted to call my mother and say, mom, I just had a baby and it's a beautiful baby. And, and she says, there was no one to call. And then she says, I give a Seder every year. And my husband is there, my two grown daughters are there, my best friends are there, they say how beautiful it is. And she says, I know, I know, she says, but it's not the same. And then the classic line emerges, I want to share it with someone who knows me, really. And she ends her testimony by saying, it's not easy to live this way. And invites her audience, including me, to finish that sentence. Well, it wasn't easy to die that way either. And then I said to myself, no, no, that's the wrong word. You asked the question, Ben, about finding proper vocabulary word. And that's a real challenge for the Holocaust. It's not that it wasn't easy to die that way. It wasn't easy to be murdered that way. And that's the legacy that she bears. Um, and uh, so I said to myself, we have to find a name for this. People who say they're dead and alive at the same time. So I invented a word called death life. One word with no separation between them. And I used to give lectures in which I mentioned death life. I was always uncomfortable with it. It's an awkward term. Doesn't really say what I mean. And then I said to myself, I've got to find a better word. And I said, let's try after death. We have a word called survival, which means I've lived through something. We don't have a word called some mortal, which means I died through something. And the after death of the Holocaust is what I have died through and which is still part of me, is if someone cut off a piece of my heart and it doesn't regenerate, and that death of others is part of my present life. It's a new sense of identity. And it's not something I invented and imposed on the Holocaust. It's something I learned from listening. And I've just given you a few examples. I could give you a dozen much lengthier examples. We don't have the time in which people try to explain. Let me try to tell you what it's like to have lost not just one person you loved, but five people or 10 people. In one case, one man came in with a, a roll of paper. He said, I've listed the 100 close relatives of mine who perished in the Holocaust. Uh, and so the two lies intertwine. Now, you asked about deathscape and hopescape. I want to give you just one example of hopescape. Um, Residents of the Hopescape have difficulty, difficulty confronting the disagreeable facts of the Holocaust. And so they find ways of searching out examples from the Holocaust, totally unrepresentative, which make you feel better. And um, the only example I'm gonna offer now is during Valentine's Day in this country, which celebrates the experience of love. Uh, uh, people send each other Valentine's Day cards. Um, 
one of the leading Holocaust institution in the United States put online a presentation called The Resistance, The Power of Love in the Holocaust. And I looked at that. At first I was repelled by it, then I was embarrassed by it. I didn't watch it. But people who inhabit what I call the hopescape of the Holocaust have difficulty confronting the horrors of the Holocaust. Um, on the other hand, they want to be committed to a study of the Holocaust. And so one of the things they do is find examples, and this is a classic example of it, in which people are shown illustrations how, how people loved each other during the Holocaust. Well, the Holocaust is not a story of love. The Holocaust is a story of hate. Uh, but it's very difficult to inhabit that. As for the deathscape of the Holocaust, I'll give you just one example. Uh, and this is from a testimony um, in which someone who was sent to Bergen-Belsen and um, sent to Bergen-Belsen and uh, has the job of dragging the corpses, which are scattered all over the camp um, and piling them up. And he tries to describe the experience. He says, you know you're gonna die. Your brain is telling you you're through, you're dead. You're just walking, but you're dead now. Because I was sure I am dead now. That's the deathscape of the Holocaust. And again, there I could give you dozens and dozens of examples of that. Uh, a very good place to start if you're interested in understanding that is a memoir which I just discovered about a year ago very little known by a Slovenian writer named Boris Pahor, P-A-H-O-R, which was published on the title of Necropolis, which means City of the Dead. It was recently republished on the title Pilgrim Among the Shadows, in which he goes back to the camp he was in, which was not Sveiler Struthof, um, near the border of France. And he was, um, he worked at, in the hospital. Um, and so he stayed alive because they need him to that work. And he describes his experience of working with dying and dead people and the physicality of the experience. And that's what the deathscape of the Holocaust is. And that's what the Holocaust is about. It's not a story of people loving each other. It's not even a story of people surviving. It's a story of people being murdered. And that, it seems to me, we have to find a way of building that into Holocaust education. So in a sense, it's a, it's a response to the unprecedented radicality of the events of the, the Holocaust and people's inability to absorb them, that one has to recast the language to try to capture it. Right. Rather than inability, I would say unwillingness. Yeah, yeah, okay. Both, 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 because we do, we have the ability through the power of the imagination to enter this deathscape. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to do. And we can both understand why people are so reluctant to do it. Yeah. But in order to say, I'm beginning to comprehend the Holocaust, you have to enter into this deathscape. Yeah. So to take, to take, this a little further and, and explore some of the sort of uh, consequences of it. A theme that you explore with, with real urgency and vigor is the way in which the facts and details of the Holocaust are increasingly distorted and falsified, and not just by those who want to deny these facts, but also by those who in a way want to honor them but are overcome by the need to look for redemptive messages and to then bend the facts in order to find dignity or vindication or defiance or, or something of that sort. Now, why, why does this matter? And what do you see as the consequences if we lose precision in dealing with the historical realities of the Holocaust? It matters because Unless you pay careful attention to the facts of the Holocaust, you get a distorted idea. I'll give you 
an example. Um, and this worries me because it seems to me this is the direction that Holocaust study is going in the schools. Um, when people talk about, for example, righteous Gentiles, which is a comfortable subject to study, or what's called the righteous among the nations, that is non-Jews who help Jews um, by hiding them or helping them in other ways so they survive. They deserve all the acclaim they receive. Yad Vashem has honored, when I last looked, 26,000. That seems like an enormous number. But if you focus on that, you overlook the fact that for each righteous Gentile, there were 10,000 unrighteous Gentiles in occupied Europe who did not help Jews, who betrayed Jews, who uh, looted Jewish property and so forth. And so if you put the emphasis on the notion of there's a redemptive meaning to the Holocaust, you deflect yourself from what actually happened. And it creates a lot of mischief, mischief because it enables some people to convince themselves that things were not that so bad because people were helping each other. In fact, um, the attempt at resistance, um, although there are lots of examples of resistance, save very few lives, not because of the failure on the part of the victims, because of the overpowering strength of the Germans. And you lose a sense of the dilemma in which people found themselves when they have lost the ability to fight back against what is destroying them. And so you begin to event examples when people fought back and you get a sense that the Holocaust was not in fact just the story of the destructive destruction of the, human, of the Jewish people. The Holocaust was also the story of the fighting back of the Jewish people. And you get an unbalanced sense and, and you lose uh, a kind of um, apprehension of what really happened. And of course, where you one also gets distortions coming in through some Holocaust testimonies. And that's been a, a feature from, from more or less the very beginning instances of that. And in the book you describe, uh, uh, you know, one, you quote one passage in which uh, oh, it's the, the daughter or the granddaughter of, of a survivor uh, 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 reports on how, how her relative was liberated by the Americans in Auschwitz and, and did something with, with an SS man's belt, which yes. proved his, his resistance or his defiance. And yet, of course, it's a, it's a fantastical notion. Well... One of the problems studying the Holocaust is that so few people are acquainted with the details of the Holocaust. I gave a talk at a synagogue uh, some years ago and they had a display case. And in it, they had a photograph of troops liberating a camp and underneath it, they write American troops liberating Auschwitz. And I said to my host, how long has this been up here? It's always been up there. Why? I said, because American troops didn't liberate Alfreds. Now, this is not a story of people lying. It's a no, story no, of no, people no. being misinformed. Unfortunately, we find this in some testimonies too. And one of the problems is that sometimes the interviewers themselves are so uninformed that these exaggerations or embellishments uh, are retained in the testimonies, and this is a real problem. Um, the Holocaust ended, it's now what, it was 76 years ago. And so the expectation that especially young people should be acquainted with the details of the Holocaust um, is, I mean, 
it's too much to expect. That's why Holocaust education, we'll talk about that later, is still so important today. Yeah. Thank you. In your analysis of the, the impulse towards redemptive narratives of the Holocaust leads me to wonder how you see the ever-growing number of national Holocaust memorials being created around the world, because there are many. I mean, the UK is creating one, and probably does it help with Holocaust understanding when a state creates a national memorial to the victims of another state's genocide? So why national memorials, and why now? You feel the need to pay tribute to this horrific event. And so you create a memorial. What that leads to is a confusion. A confusion with between what I call commemoration and remembering. A memorial is a commemoration of something that happened. Um, it doesn't mean that it helps you to remember the details of what happened. Every year on Holocaust, um, Remembrance Day in this country, in America, in any case, synagogues throughout the country uh, have a ritual commemoration of the Holocaust. Grandchildren of survivors light candles, the rabbi will sing El Mola Rachamim, the audience, if they know it, will sing the partisan song. It's a commemoration. But if I were to say to members of that audience, um, do you know how many Jews were killed at Babi Yar? Babi Yar? Can you tell me something about the camp at Skarzysko, Kanyema, to say nothing of Sobibor? You would find that most people would have nothing to say. So, although the monuments may seem admirable, um, they really don't help us to remember the Holocaust. Now, there's another problem which you are uh, you know, addressing in answering that question. Um, nations build monuments to the Holocaust, but at the same time, as we know, which is happening in Poland now, they have difficulty addressing the collaboration of their own people in the perpetration of the Holocaust. And that issue still has to be studied in great detail. Um, we still don't have a satisfaction, although we have uh, all kinds of um, monuments uh, addressing the heroism of the Dutch people in saving Jews. Um, few people know that there was a Dutch SS unit. I watched a testimony once uh, from one of the few surviving members of the, Zundercom the last Zunderkommando in Auschwitz, and he tells, tells about talking to an SS man who was on guard inside the camp, and it turns out to be Dutch. The Dutch, And I said to myself, what is a Dutch SS man doing? The whole issue of collaboration in Poland, in Hungary, in France, in most of the nations of Europe still hasn't been addressed. So my feeling is when another monument is built, uh, it's good that someone feels the he or she, uh, a nation feels they have to address what happened, but it's, it, it still leaves unaddressed the question of that particular nation's involvement in what happened during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For me personally, your essay about the historian and novelist Hagi Adler is particularly interesting and, and impressive because I regard his work as a, a vast and unique Holocaust testimony. And also through his study of Theresienstadt, I learned a new regard for that first and as it were heroic generation of survivor historians whose work is now largely neglected but has at least as much to teach us as recent scholarship. So I just wonder what, what drew you to studying him and where do you see him in the, the literary and commemorative landscape? 
H.G. Adler is a unique phenomenon in the history of Holocaust discourse. Um, a, a colleague and a friend called me one day some years ago, and she said we are, she teaches at a university in Canada, said we are organizing an international conference on the works of H.G. Adler, and would you give a keynote address? I mean, the interesting thing was there were two keynote addresses, one I gave, the other one was given by Adler's son, mm -hmm. and I was a little intimidated by that. To tell you the truth, he had given so many keynote addresses on his father that um, mine was much more interesting than his. Don't quote me. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, um, I had heard of Adler, of course, through his work on today's Einstein. Now, Adler was a unique phenomenon because he is the only Holocaust uh, survivor um, of Theresienstadt, where he spent a couple of years because his wife was a doctor. And so uh, they were not uh, listed for deportation for a long time because they needed doctors inside the camp. Finally, he and his wife and his wife's mother were deported to Auschwitz. Um, he was sent to the right, he was a young man. His wife could not leave, was unwilling to leave her mother alone. So went with her mother to the left. Uh, we just don't know whether she knew what that meant. She just wanted to be with her mother. Uh, in 1955, this is only 10 years after the war, Adler published the first extended study of a concentration camp. It's only 10 years after the war. Now, I happen to have a copy of it here. It was only 850 pages. You can see. And I'm still reading it. It's it's a work of phenomenal scholarship. He started taking notes while he was in Theresienstadt. Um, when he was listed for deportation, he left those notes with Rabbi Leo Beck, the head of the Jewish community in Berlin, who was preserved by the Germans because he was so famous that he, they didn't want to deport him. After the war, he um, reclaimed those notes and spent the next 10 years writing this massive study, which is called Theresienstadt 1941-1945, um, Das Antlitz eines, Zwangs, eines Zwangsgemeinschaft, which is translated as um, the face of a coerced community. And that word is so important, a coerced community, because it means that Life in Theresienstadt was not a life in which people decided what they wanted to do and didn't want to do. What they could do was restricted by what the Germans allowed them to do. So it's a massive, and I mean massive, detailed study of what it's like for Jews to exist in an environment where they were able to do certain things and not able to do certain things always under the constraints of what the Germans required them to do. Now, he was a, an indefatigable historian, but he is the only person I know who is also a major novelist of the um, Holocaust and a major poet of the Holocaust, um, wrote book after book during his career, um, his poetry has now been translated, but you really have to read it in German because he developed a style uh, which is not really carried over into the English translation, which I would call abrasive, in which the words kind of rubbed against each other. He, he needed to convey the conflict that the Holocaust represented. Um, and um, he wrote many novels, but his most famous trilogy is three books called the Panorama, the Journey, and the Wall, uh, translated incidentally by Peter Filkins, who two years ago published an extraordinary and really a masterpiece biography. It's only 700 pages, uh, exhaustively researched, but stylistically totally accessible 
It's a brilliant work, and if you're interested in Adler, you begin with that biography. Um, it's um, it's called H.G. Um, Adler: A Life um, in Many Worlds, and that's exactly right because Adler um, inhabited many worlds. So it was an education for me in preparing for this address uh, to read everything I could get my hands on that he wrote and that others wrote. Uh, about him. He's a major figure. Uh, I mean, it's phenomenal that in 1960, five years after he published the Theresienstadt book, he decided that he had left some things out, he had found some new materials, and so rewrote it, uh, this 800-page book, um, and uh, was published in 1960 as an expanded edition. He's still not as well known as he should be, but uh, you are right in admiring him. Interesting thing is, point. His name is H. G. His name is Hans Günther Adler, but he, after the war, took on the name H. G. Adler. Why did he do that? By an extraordinary coincidence, Hans Günther was the name of the SS officer in Prague in charge of the deportation of the Jews from Prague to Theresienstadt, and what. Adler Fane found that out. He gave up the name Hans Günther and just took on the initials H.G. And then he, he went on to, to write an immense study of deportations called Der Verwaltete Mensch, which is another brilliant formulation. And I mean, his, his use of the German language is quite extraordinary. And it's, it's very difficult to translate. But yeah, one of the things about the Theresienstadt volume is that it has immense literary value, apart from being excellent history. And then also, of course, it's a, it's a source book because he cites and reproduces hundreds of documents. So it's a most extraordinary work. Yes, it is. And the Favalto Domench, which we could translate as the administered man, again, he chose very carefully which words he wanted to use. Uh, people in the camps um, or, I mean, there are lots of books have been written called I Chose Life or We Chose Life, but that is a misnomer because no one chose life or death in the camps. The Germans chose whether you lived or died. And so he wanted to analyze what it's like to be a human being when someone else is administering your life for you. Yeah, a remarkable, a remarkable figure. And then my, my last question before we maybe get, get some comments and, and questions from, from the audience is, is this. Is Holocaust research, remembrance and education going well or badly in your view? Well, will you <clears throat> give me an extra hour to answer that? <laughs> You've got five minutes. <laughs> in a word, Holocaust research is alive and well. Holocaust education is less alive and well than it should be. Um, Holocaust remembrance, if you make that distinction between commemoration and remembering, commemoration is more alive than remembering. I mean, in order to remember the Holocaust, you have to be familiar with it. And I mean, let me just say, I don't have time to talk about this, but one place to begin, if you want to know what it was like to have endured the Holocaust is with the testimony of Holocaust survivors. It's not the only place to go. I mean, one of the things Adler helped me to understand is that Holocaust studies is an interdisciplinary subject. You can't just read the history. You can't just read the literature, I mean the imaginative literature, and you can't just watch the testimony. You really have to get involved in all three. But a good place to begin is with the testimony, especially the testimonies at the Fortune of Archives at Yale. Uh, um, I've now watched 320 of those testimonies. I've done 80 uh, myself. and. The notion that survivors don't know how to talk about what happened to them and need help uh, is utter nonsense. Uh, what is amazing, even though the language may be a little halting because it's not their first language, um, 
they have the ability to recall and to transmit in their own language uh, the most extraordinary events, which we would call unbelievable, but they're saying it. Well, Holocaust research. Uh, what I'm most impressed with, aside from the fact that scholars like uh, Jan Grabowski, Omer Batov, even um, Chris Browning, who have been at it for a long time, and Yehuda Bauer, whose study of, um, of a ghetto came out just a few years ago, major scholars are still at work, but what I find most extraordinary is the number of younger scholars um, who are getting into the field and doing very important and original work. Uh, an organization called Lessons and Legacies has an international conference on the Holocaust every two years. It comes out of Northwestern University. And the last two I attended, uh, two years ago, and I think four year, five years ago, many of the papers were presented by young scholars, some even by graduate students. So it's amazing that something that ended more than 70 years ago should be so alive today. I mean, 75 years after World War I, we were not having international conferences on World War I. It wasn't a dead subject, but it wasn't alive as the Holocaust still is in the research community. So I feel very hopeful about that. As for Holocaust education, it seems to me the tendency, it's very difficult. The Holocaust is a disagreeable subject for young students and for their teachers. So what seems to me to be happening is a gradual drifting toward what I mentioned earlier, finding examples that are more manageable. Now the Holocaust is an unmanageable subject. I've written a lot of books on the Holocaust and if my books don't upset an audience, then my books I feel are a failure. Anything you read about the Holocaust should be, must be upsetting, okay? Do we wanna upset junior and senior high school students? The problem we haven't solved yet is how to acquaint students with the ability to live at the same time a life of despair and a life of joy. It's possible to do. Holocaust survivors, have been, they speak of their compartmentalized lives. They get married, they have children, they go to the movies with their friends, and then they say there's the other and the other is bleak and the other is dark. And we have to educate students how to handle the dark and the joy at the same time. People ask me, don't you get depressed during the work you do? It's a depressing subject. Yes, the work I do depresses me. One of the things I've discovered, and it depresses me because when certain kinds of people get in power, they have the control to destroy other people's lives. And that's a depressing idea. What I've learned from studying the Holocaust, and this is still the challenge for Holocaust education, is that for some human beings, power is literally more fulfilling than the experience of love. Uh, for me, I manage the work I do on the Holocaust because the other part of my life is driven by the experience of love for my family, for a few, de a few dear friends. But during the Holocaust, and this, this is still hard to explain, the shift in the German population toward an admiration for power, which happened very slowly during the 1930s, is a very dangerous idea. Uh, and we have to enable students as we educate them to appreciate what happens when power takes control in a society. Uh, and, but to help them to understand that this is not necessarily destructive of their lives, it just adds to their understanding of what it means to be a human being. What we learn from the Holocaust not only is what it meant to be a human being, but what it meant to be an inhuman being. And that's a very difficult subject to educate someone about. Um, as far as remembrance is concerned, um, I simply don't expect, I mean, although people have said American Jews are obsessed 
was the subject of the Holocaust. Most American Jews, like most Americans, know very little about the Holocaust. Um, whether adults need to be educated depends on whether the adults are willing to be educated. But remembrance of the Holocaust, we're just going to have to accept that, means remembering one of the most horrific events in the history of mankind. And if you're not prepared to confront that, then you ignore it. You ignore it. We can't all ignore it because then it's as if it never happened. And that's simply unacceptable to me. Yes. I mean, it, but it, it does, you want, at times one almost has the impression memorials are built as a way of not confronting it. Um, it's, there are so many ways of evading the Holocaust while you think you are confronting it. Yes. And memorials are one of those ways. Yes. Okay, well, I think we've, yes, we've, we've, come to, to the end of, of this question and answer session. So Christine, if we have questions from from, part of, from the, the audience, then. We do, we do. Um, we have a few that's come to me directly and then we've got a few that have been posted in the chat. So I'll take a few of these, um, as many as we can have time for. Um, Kate is asking you, to what extent do you think that Charlotte Delbo's articulation of deep memory is her attempt to take readers into the deathscape? Well, I've written a lot about Charlotte. She was an, I knew Charlotte Delbo when she came to speak in Boston, she stayed with us. And she, the one bad thing she did, she drove my daughter out of the house because Charlotte was a chain smoker. And I said to my daughter, I do not have the heart to tell this woman, Charlotte, you cannot smoke in my house. I wish I did because she died of lung cancer uh, from smoking. Uh, and the last time I saw her, she was bald. And she said, do I, not, do I not look beautiful? All the young women in Paris these days have no hair. They wear short hair. But of course, she was in chemotherapy. And that's why she was hair. Yes, um, deep memory. Um, we just don't have the time to go, at, go into that in detail. I have an essay on Charlotte Delbo in the book. And if you're interested in it, you should read that. Uh, Charlotte Delbo distinguished between what she called uh, memoir profonde, deep memory, and memoir ordinaire, which I call common memory. And she said, deep memory is my Auschwitz experience, and common memory is what movie did you see yesterday? And I live in both. She said, but there's no way I can discard deep memory. That became, remains part of my body and my experience. Thank you. We have another question from Glenn, um, who's asking, um, who's pointing to a quote in your book, Using and Abusing the Holocaust from 2006, in which you discuss the representational challenges that the Shoah uniquely poses, suggesting at one point that it has, quote, no real interpretative value and no redeeming feature. You caution against the distortions produced by oversimplification, leveling this charge at historians and their construction of seamless narrative tropes. So Glenn is asking, has the historical discourse evolved since you made those remarks and whom among re recent historians would you say has heeded those warnings? I think you got a little bit into this um, in some of Ben's questions, but if, if you could elaborate a bit um, on this. People continually, no, sometimes, read back quotes to me, which I've forgotten I've written. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I say that I really say that, you know, and I don't always share the opinions I expressed some years ago. Um, I guess one of my, not, not problems, no, uh, one of the features of Holocaust history is that because of what history historians do, they can't go into the experience of individuals. That's just not what historians do. So I felt that there were limitations. But I spend 75% of my time reading Holocaust history, 25% of my time reading Holocaust literature, not only because there's more of it, but because it's so important. Recent works, yes, you ask about recent. Jan Grabowski, of a woman named Hi, Susan Heim, I think her name was Susan Heim, wrote a few years ago 
an extraordinary study of the women's camp at Ravensbrück. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the uh, book I mentioned by uh, Volker Ulrich, this 1,600-page, two-volume study of Hitler, extraordinary works uh, uh, are being have always been produced by historians. One of the sad things, I mean, one of the things, I knew Raoul Hilberg, some of you may not even remember Raoul Hilberg's uh, name, but his, the destruction of European Jewry was the first extended study of the Holocaust in, written in America. Some years ago, I read the three volume study by Sir Richard Evans of the Third Reich. And if you look in the index of the bibliography of all three volumes, Raoul Hilberg's name doesn't even appear. And I said to myself, is this our fate, you know, to be forgotten? I mean, uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, at least, you know, I'm going on 92 now. I'm still not forgotten because you are talking to me and I have people listening. Eventually, you are superseded. Uh, and some historical work has been superseded. But I would be the last person in the world to criticize the kind of research that's being done by Holocaust historians today. Thank you for that. Thanks for a very full answer. Um, so we have a question from Beth, um, Beth Cohen, who uh, a former uh, colleague of mine from Clark. I, I think you know her very well as well. Um, she thanks you for the stimulating remarks and um, is curious about what you think about the, the hologram survivors that the USC Shoah Foundation is creating. Um, so that survivors live on. And she, she suggests that this is the antithesis of after death. Uh, ben, can I have another two hours, please? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll say this to everyone who is still listening. The holograms created by the Shoah Foundation are a waste of time and a waste of money. If you took the millions of dollars that they are using to create those holograms and donated to elderly Jews in Israel who are Holocaust survivors and can hardly make it on their small income, you would be doing a mitzvah or a good deed. I mean, the pretense that talking to a data bank, you are really talking to a human being is utter nonsense. Putting those poor elderly Holocaust survivors through the seven or eight day ordeal and being asked question after question after question um, is expo exploitation of human beings. In addition, I've watched many uh, parts of these. I have yet to hear a question asked and an answer given, which is worth asking and worth hearing. They now have condensed the survivor experience into a five minute uh, presentation of their Holocaust experience. Can you imagine a survivor telling their Holocaust experience to an audience in five minutes? Um, technology is already taking over our lives in other areas. In this area, it's taking over the Holocaust experience and I find it very regrettable. Is that all right, Beth? I think, I think that's probably a good answer. <laughs> she's, she seems to be agreeing. Um, we have actually two questions about, um, uh, s about suicide, actually. Um, uh, one from Megan, um, who is asking if you would say that suicides of some Holocaust survivors are more a result of the after death, or are they a more nuanced understanding of mental health concerns irrespective of the Shoah? Or is there a relationship between these fraught causes that could not possibly be compartmentalized as such? And there's another question um, related, I think, uh, to Primo Levi um, on the same theme um, about why people like Primo Levi who had survived the camps but then took their own life later. Um, and how does this relate to the after death concept? This is a question from Sue. So there's a question from Megan and Sue that's kind of on the same well, it's more relevant to Primo Levi. We don't know. Some people insist that Primo fell over uh, uh, and accidentally fell over the balcony and died. 
um, but um, I talked to one woman who visited the house and told me that the balcony is so high it's impossible to fall over it. You'd have to climb over it. Um, Primo Levi was in treatment for depression when he committed suicide. Primo Levi also had recently had uh, prostate surgery. Uh, having had it myself, I can tell you that is not the most uplifting experience of a man's life. So I don't know what impact that he had. He was living with his elderly mother and his elderly mother-in-law. Um, and that must have added to his depression. So we don't know that Primo Levi committed suicide because he was a Holocaust survivor. So I'm not prepared to, uh, prepared to say that his death was a result of his having been a Holocaust survivor. I think we might have time. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, if you, if, if, sorry, you go ahead, go ahead. No, would you like to answer the other, the other question about sort of more the, the phenomenon more generally? Well, I've never talked to a Holocaust survivor who committed suicide, mm. obviously. Um, and the testimonies I hear of the people who don't, I don't know how large that number is. Mm. Um, so it, it, it's just very difficult to respond to that question without more knowledge of the situation. Appreciate that. Um, I think we have time for one more uh, question. Unfortunately, time is, is running short. We don't want to, we, as much as you're, you're very generous offering to our um, answers, um, we don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, we have a question from Archie, um, who was wondering if you could comment on whether your term after death was influenced by or how it's different to Primo Levi's discussion of the figure of the Musulman, um, as well as Giorgio Agamben's exploration of that term. Yes, I've read Agamben's book. <laughs> it was not influenced by it at all, uh, frankly. Uh, it was influenced by what I was hearing from survivors in their testimonies, trying to explain to audience, not just to me, but to audiences, what it was like to get on with you. I don't like the expression survived. I prefer endured. Um, they endured what they went through and then they got on with their life because they chose not to commit suicide. So you have to get on with your life. Um, I'm sorry, give me the question again. Just, just that, what, was it, um, were you influenced? Oh, by that was that mine, yeah. 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 Um, um, now, the, the Muslim men, most of the Muslim men have died. And so they are not dealing with what I call the after death of the Holocaust. There were people who were so emaciated and so decimated by the, their physical condition that they just couldn't go on anymore. But uh, and that's totally different from what I'm talking about. The after death of the Holocaust is uh, something that is experienced by people who are healthy and normal um, and not traumatized in their uh, regular life, but um, carry with them a burden of loss, which has now inhabited their sense of identity. And so I think that's unrelated to the Muslim. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's probably all the time that we have. There has been a lot, there have been a lot of comments thanking you in chat um, and saying that, you know, that this has been a thought provoking evening um, and thanking you for your remarks and that it's been a great pleasure. And I can only agree with those comments that this has been such an, a wonderful opportunity to hear uh, from you, Professor Langer, and um, thank you to Ben for no, no. I just like to, to 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 second that. It's been a it's been a, a, a privilege and and a joy to to hear you. Um, and while we can't go on for another two hours, I will I will promise that we'll reconvene for the the launch of your next volume. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so just get to, going. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, let me recite, recite one of my favorite lines of poetry. <clears throat> 
the grave is a fine and private place, but none I think do there embrace. So if you want my next volume, it's gonna be a very narrow confine. So. <laughs> thank you, Professor Langer, and thank you thank to the you audience. So thank you, thank you, and good evening, and good afternoon. Thank you. I thank you all for attending. Bye-bye.